Welcome to this video lecture on the subject of hypothesis testing, which simply means testing theories. A hypothesis is a theory, so hypothesis testing refers to testing theories, and we use statistics to do this. Let me start with a story. Muriel and some friends were having tea on the lawn. This really happened. Muriel remarked that the tea tastes better if the milk is added to the cup first and then the tea, rather than the tea and then the milk. Ronald was also at this tea party in the lawn and he didn't believe that Muriel could tell the difference. So he issued a challenge to Muriel. He offered to make up eight cups of tea, four of them with the milk added to the cup first and four of them with the tea added first. And then he would present them to Muriel in random order and see if she could tell the difference. Muriel agreed to the challenge. So Ronald made up these eight cups of tea, four with the milk added first, four with the tea added first, and he presented them to Muriel. And would you believe, Muriel correctly identified all the cups of tea. She was able to tell which ones had the milk added first. Why am I telling you this story? Well, not only did Ronald go on to become a famous statistician, probably the most famous of the 20th century, Sir Ronald Fisher. But this story illustrates how we test theories in statistics. First of all, we begin with a theory. This is how we do research or how we do science. We begin with a theory. And Ronald had a theory. His theory was that Muriel couldn't tell the difference. That any difference that, that she chose between one cup and another was just random variation. She was just picking the cups at random. That was his theory. The alternative hypothesis, if, the, if that null hypothesis is not true, the alternative hypothesis is that Muriel does better than someone choosing randomly, that Muriel has an ability to distinguish the different types of tea from each other. So always in statistics, we have some null hypothesis. It's the theory that we begin with. At the start, it's neither proven nor disproven. That's why we call it null. So we state the null hypothesis, and then we go and we gather some data. We typically take a random sample of data from the population of interest, and we see how well do the data agree with the theory. And that's, of course, just what Ronald did. He went and he gathered some data by presenting the cups to Muriel. He would expect her to get some right and some wrong. But in fact, she got all eight cups correct. So if it's true that Muriel can't tell the difference, well, then what just happened there was very unlikely to happen. Choosing the correct eight cups, the correct four that were milk added first and the four that had tea added first, she picked the, the, the cups correctly, even though there's 70 different ways she could have said which cups had, had tea added first and which had milk added first. There are 70 different ways when you have eight cups to divide them into two groups of four. So there's only a chance of one in 70 that she would have got it correct. And she did get it correct. One in 70 is a very small probability. So if she was just being lucky, she was being very lucky. One in 70 is actually 1.4%. And that's such a small probability that you and I, and even Ronald, would agree that Muriel must be able to tell the difference. Typically, when we test a theory in statistics, we test it at the 5% level. That is, if the data that arises has a probability of less than 5% of arising under the null hypothesis, then we decide to reject the null hypothesis. Ronald's theory must be wrong. Because if what he said was right, there's only a chance of 1.4% that this would have happened. So we call this a p-value. And the p-value is the probability of obtaining the data if the null hypothesis is true. So in statistics, we often have a null hypothesis that says the mean is a certain number, or the proportion is a certain number, or the two proportions are the same. And we apply this to research that we might do in any area of human life, in commerce or sport or medicine. We begin with two different drugs and we say, let's assume that they're both the same. And if there's more uh, patients in the aspirin group that recover compared to the paracetamol group, well, they're just being lucky. But then if it turns out that there's an unusually high number of people in one group who recover, 
Well, then we're forced to the conclusion that the null hypothesis that the treatments were equal must be rejected and there actually is a superior treatment. And that's how we gather knowledge by doing research in this way. Now, of course, when you take a sample from a population, it's possible that the sample will be optimistic or pessimistic. So it could happen that a null hypothesis is true and we still reject that null hypothesis. It could, for example, happen with the Muriel story that Muriel can't tell the difference, but she was just very fortunate on a single occasion. So that it's possible for that to happen. And that will happen 5% of the time when we test the 5% level. And that's called a type 1 error. It's also possible for a type 2 error to occur, that a null hypothesis may not be true, but the data don't prove that it's not true. The just data aren't strong enough to prove that it's not true. And that could be because the sample is too small or because the sample is unfortunate. Uh, for example, suppose Muriel uh, can generally tell the difference, but it's an unfortunate sample. It's one of Muriel's poorer performances. Then that might happen. And so um, we choose 5% as the significance level, which makes the probability of type 1 error quite small. And it's even, if it's even more serious to avoid a type 1 error, then we can choose 1%, which we would call very significant, or 0.1%, which we would call highly significant. But usually we use 5%, which we call significant. The way we test theories and statistics is very similar to the way that cases are tried in court. When the court case begins, a defendant is charged with some offence, and it is assumed that the defendant is innocent of the charges. That's the null hypothesis. It's assumed to be true at the outset. Then the evidence is assessed. And the evidence is like the data in statistics. And we look at the evidence and we ask, is this evidence likely to arise if the defendant is innocent? So it's very similar how we make these judgments. But in statistics, we allow the data to speak. We state the null hypothesis, which usually says the mean is equal to what it's supposed to be, or the proportion is equal to what it's claimed to be, or the two means are the same, or the two proportions are the same. So typically the null hypothesis says there's not much story here in the data. There's just nothing special going on. It's all just random variation. And the alternative hypothesis typically says, no, there is a difference. One medicine is better than the other. There really is a, an effect being caused by this factor that we're studying. And then if the p-value falls below 5%, if the data are unusual, if the data are unlikely to have arisen under the null hypothesis, then we reject the null hypothesis in favour of the alternative. Now, an alternative hypothesis could be either one-sided or two-sided. For example, um, Ronald assumed that Muriel couldn't tell the difference. If we reject that null hypothesis, it could be that Muriel does better than someone who's guessing, or it could be that she does worse. So we can have a two-sided alternative. Or we can just have a one-sided alternative. Muriel does better. In the same way, we can test the theory about the mean. On, the, on a wrapper of a bar of chocolate, it says the average contents of these bars is 50 grams. Well, the null hypothesis says the mean is 50 grams. The alternative could say it's not equal to 50 grams, or the alternative could say it's less than 50 grams. Because depending on our perspective, it might be only a departure on the lesser side that would give us any concern. And so we might not worry about the two-sided we might choose just a one-sided alternative instead. So when we test a theory in statistics, the first thing we do is we state what theory we're testing. We state the null hypothesis and we state the alternative hypothesis, specifying if it's a one-sided or two-sided alternative. What would lead to rejection of the null hypothesis? Then we draw a random sample. Then and only then we draw a random sample. And then we calculate what is the probability of obtaining the data in the sample if the null hypothesis is true. And if that probability is less than 5%, then we reject the null hypothesis. If it's greater than 5%, then we accept the null hypothesis. Accepting the null hypothesis doesn't mean that we've proven it true. It just means we have not proven it false. So when we accept the null hypothesis, the assumption stands. But when we reject the null hypothesis, we make an assertion that the data have led us to uh, state that the null hypothesis should be rejected in favour of the alternative. You can read more about this in the textbook in chapter 5.